Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Mark Blythe and this is my basement because in times of COVID and you're doing homeschooling, you've got to find a, pli a quiet place you can transmit from. Welcome to the Rhodes Centre seminar series. It is a great pleasure today to bring uh, Dr. Pavlina Chernova to talk to us today about her book, The Case for a Job Guarantee. Some background on this before we start. Um, one of the things that I was constantly getting requests to talk about uh, in our speaker series and on our podcast series is, of course, the exciting set of ideas that's very much out there in the world called modern monetary theory. And uh, Professor Chernova is, uh, is part of the group of scholars that's generating those ideas. But where she fits into this is less on the kind of monetary side and the monetary plumbing and the stuff to do with consolidated balance sheets and why deficit spending is not the terror that we think it is, and more on if you will, the kind of real world component part of this, which is the job guarantee, which is both a counter cyclical macroeconomic stabilizer and just a damn good thing to do. And that's basically the case that she makes for us in her, uh, her book, which I've got here, The Case for a Job Guarantee, which was selected by Martin Wolf of the Financial mm -hmm. Times as one of the best books of 2020, calling it uh, an argument that you may disagree with, but one you absolutely have to engage with. Uh, so Professor Chernova is uh, an associate professor and director of the economics program at Bard College and a research associate at the Levy Economics Institute and is also an expert at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And with that introduction and setup, I will now pass on to uh, Professor Chernova to tell us about the case for a job guarantee. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Economists don't talk a lot about uh, the right to employment, um, but I want to start off that way and um, um, you know, walk us a little bit through the journey, the journey in the United States of why the right to employment has been so difficult to secure. And um, then I'd like to make the case that there is a, there's a good economic um, case to be made uh, for securing the right to employment through a job guarantee. Um, through a policy proposal that is, well, simply better than what we currently have. So I have some slides here I'm going to share. And, okay, all right. So securing the right to employment, how can we connect human rights to economic policy? Um, the first mention of the right to employment, uh, I believe, is in the French Constitution of 1793. Um, that recurring demand, you know, has kind of waned and reappeared and waned again. But in the United States, um, it was really during the Great Depression that we picked up that conversation of uh, securing the right to employment. Um, there is, of course, a international recognition, formal international recognition, um, both in the UN Charter, but um, later on formalized. Uh, what does it mean to have economic rights? Uh, it was formalized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then, of course, there are a variety of treaties international treaties, um, any national constitution that has been inspired by the UN declaration or even prior, as I just mentioned, that has been drafted even before these um, international attempts. Uh, there, are many, there are many countries that have the right to employment in those constitutions and that mandate um, is still unmet, as well as the ILO has multiple documents. Um, the most recent one in 2019, where they produce a report on the future of work and again, situate this broader agenda uh, policy gender around the right um, to employment. Of course, the job guarantee was also a signature policy um, during the civil rights uh, era. And uh, now it was um, singled out uh, in the Green New Deal resolution, um, as well as it is part of uh, the uh, modern calls to democratize work in all of its forms. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the journey uh, in the United States. So the first attempt to translate uh, the right to paid remunerative employment um, ha happens uh, during the New Deal. Uh, there is an articulation uh, of that in the report on the Committee on Economic Security that is drafted by Harry Hopkins and Francis Perkins, uh, among others. 
um, uh, in the FDR administration. And the idea there is quite uh, clear that um, there is a there is a need to provide employment relief, and um, that that must be done through direct employment, direct action by the government. Um, the Civil Works Administration at the time was very successful, and uh, but it was short lived. In the 1934, 35, uh, the CWA employed many unemployed men, and it was so popular that at the time, uh, you know, people regarded that as something that government owed them. Um, of course, there were conservative uh, interests, you know, uh, racist Southern employers, uh, farmers who depended on cheap migrant labor, you know, they, they kind of opposed these policies. Um, and, and at the time, uh, FDR was reasonably conservative um, and he was convinced by the, his conservative budget director to cancel the CWA uh, because they believed that if they had renewed it, they will not be able to get rid of it. Um, and so they didn't renew it. So that was our first attempt. But FDR eventually kind of articulates this aspirational goal that we need, just like we're securing civil rights, we also have to secure economic rights. And you have seen them, um, but it, he leads with the right to a job. Um, and you know there have been some steps made to secure the, the rest of the um, economic rights that he outlines with the exception of medical care in the United States, uh, but the right to a job still uh, hangs there. And uh, economic, economists have a fair amount of responsibility uh, for, for why that is the case. Um, <clears throat> there's a, another action, another attempt to secure the right to work. And you know, in those days, it was called the right to work. Um, today, it has different meaning. But in the full employment bill of 1945, you will see that explicit language that the right to work must be get guarantee this is the responsibility of the government um, and uh, that is contested once again by uh, conservative interest the ambush comes in the form of the employment act of 1946 where um, that is removed the language of the right to work is removed and now the goal becomes a little more amorphous now we're talking about maximum employment whatever that may mean and an explicit emphasis also on price stability that it is the the job of the public sector to achieve maximum employment price stability in cooperation with private enterprise and so what we've got is really kind of a, a articulation of what at that time you might call a Keynesian policy that would um, look like, you know, a significant government stimulus to the economy, but through, um, you know, uh, stimulating the activity of private enterprise to achieve um, full employment and price, uh, maximum employment and price stability. Um, there is a general dissatisfaction with this mandate that comes in the 70s. Uh, because, as you know, we experienced the great stagflation. We have infl uh, high inflation, high unemployment. And um, the Humphrey Hawkins Act, or the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act, once again puts the responsibility back um, onto the government to uh, secure full employment. But by then, this idea of full employment is quite amorphous, it's quite separate from the idea of the right to employment. And as uh, students of eco economics know um, the full employment is this uh, you know moving target. It's this definition that um, it could mean anything. Um, you can see statements, for example, by Bill Vickery, who thought that the last time we had we had achieved full employment was in 1926, um, I believe, when we had 1.6 percent unemployment rate. Um, you can see, you know, statements by Harry Hopkins, who is also talking about 2% or less than 2%. I have found statements in Keynes's work, less than 1% unemployment is full employment. But um, in the Full Employment and Gro Balanced Growth Act, we actually have explicit numeric targets, 3 to 4%. And so here we are, we had 3 or 4% uh, prior to the pandemic, and no one, I think, um, would argue that that was full employment. And in fact, we had conversations um, at the policy level that there is plenty of labor market slack. So what we have is um, a conversation that takes place in economic theory, 
um, that is redefining what it means to have uh, full employment. And it no longer means the right to everyone who wants a job to have it, but is now associated with some level of positive unemployment. Now, all of this becomes a bit more complicated because um, in the 50s and the 60s, we formalize the trade-off between unemployment and inflation in the familiar Phillips curve and the so-called NIRO. That's the canon of economic theory. And so, so long as we have a policy objective where governments are charged with securing maximum employment and price stability, and there is an assumed trade-off between the two, then um, we, we have to choose. The policymaker is, is given um, an impossible choice, essentially. Now, this trade-off is what I want to argue is something we need to give up. Um, there isn't strong evidence uh, for this trade-off. And indeed, there is a, an alternative. There is a way to stabilize economies without tolerating unemployment in the name of price stability. And that's the function of the job guarantee proposal, or at least one of the functions. So the problem that, as I see it, is that Nairo has become a policy guide um, to the extent that um, monetary policy is charged with the macro management of the economy, there is an implicit notion, an idea that we need to search for the optimal level of unemployment so that we know when to stop providing whatever stimulus the Fed thinks it is providing. So here's a quote from Jay Powell from 2019. And we need the concept of the natural rate of unemployment and we need to have some sense of whether unemployment is high, low or just right. And so I think that this is, you know, this is, I think, uh, uh, a, a problem, a serious problem from the point of view, both of economic theory, of economic policy, but also from the point of view of human rights. What is the just right level of unemployment and poverty? Now, in fairness, credit where credit is due, Jay Powell then, you know, on the testimony argued, look, the relationship between the, sl the slack in the economy and employment inflation has gone away. So we cannot find um, the NIRO. And, but he still kind of insists on this uh, relationship. At the end of the day, there has to be some connection. So even if we cannot find it empirically, um, there has to be some connection between um, those two, because if we push unemployment too low, wages, God forbid, might start rising. And that is, um, uh, we need to ward off against those wage increases because that can fuel inflation. And we have a better way of doing this. We have a better way of controlling inflation than actually keeping uh, unemployment. Okay, so we don't wanna be insisting on the necessity for policy purposes. So we, and then we have an, an inflation conundrum at the policy level as well. Uh, uh, Tarullo had said in 2017 that the Fed has no reliable theory of inflation. Janet Yellen herself had argued that um, the dynamics between inflation and employment may be misspecified in some fundamental way. So if we have no theory of inflation and no theory of the Nairo, then what do we do next? Um, but you will find nevertheless the Nairo in every macroeconomic model um, and um, it needs to go. Now, this is what it looks like. Um, the unemployment rate for the United States, very volatile. Um, I like to call it the human yo-yo as you know, with, with every recession in mass people are, you know, lose their jobs. Recoveries have become more protracted, slower. There are all sorts of catch 22s that the unemployed face. I enumerate them in the book, um, especially people at the lower end, um, low wage, um, uh, workers have uh, the hardest time uh, re-entering the labor market. Long-term unemployed have the hardest time securing employment. There are certain demographic groups that have barriers to employment. Um, and so when we are asking the question of what is the optimal level of unemployment, I think in the same breath, we're asking the question of who should be unemployed. When we're defining uh, full employment as three or 4% unemployment, um, you know, we're implicitly saying that, you know, there will be some folks who will be scrambling, they will be looking, they will be the most vulnerable, but that's okay, um, because 
it generates price stability. Okay, so I also um, use this metaphor as unemployment as a silent epidemic. This was way before the pandemic. I had written a paper um, enumerating some of the social costs of unemployment. The, but the basic premise here is that if we observe how unemployment behaves, first of all, it's chronic, even in the best of times, there is involuntary unemployment. But also when you look at it spatially, how it propagates, it, it quite literally uh, acts as an infectious agent. If there is a, a community that experiences mass layoffs, those ripple through the community and um, more folks lose their jobs because of the mass layoffs that have occurred and the uh, decline in purchasing spending power. So if you just watch how unemployment spreads, it's, it's truly a viral phenomena. But then it is viral in the sense that it has these impacts on the unemployed and on their families. So it is, uh, it is quite literally deadly. This is not a hyperbole. Um, we have uh, a data on the increase in mortality, a permanent increase in mortality, a high correlation between um, unemployment and suicides. We know that it is costly in terms of the enormous social costs, not just the scarring effects that you typically hear about, the loss of wages and income, but you know, uh, health costs. Uh, mental, physical, health costs, uh, outcomes for spouses, for children, communities, foregone output, uh, you name it. Um, it's just that at the macro level, we don't incorporate all of those costs. Um, and I think that if you, if you were to do that, um, a case can be made that they dwarf the costs of um, simply providing a job to somebody who needs one. Okay, so um, I distinguish in the book between real costs and financial costs. Um, the real cost, the, for, the foregone uh, real output and the real destitution that comes with unemployment is what matters. It's not the financial co costs. The financial costs are already baked in. They are uh, costs we cannot avoid because governments are ultimately responsible for dealing with the fallout of poverty and unemployment. And of course, many other socioeconomic problems are connected to the problem of unemployment. So these are costs that will be there and are incurred anyway. Um, and there's just a better way of, of addressing that problem. So um, if you take the idea that unemployment behaves as a silent epidemic, then how do we deal, or at least how are we supposed to deal with them if we were functioning? Uh, you know, uh, function if we, if we had a functioning government and hopefully we'll do better, but prevention, right? And preparedness, this is how we deal with pandemics or epidemics. Two things we did not have, but if that is the way to think about economic problems, then we act not when it is too late and when the crisis is upon us and when unemployment has shot through the roof, but indeed we put in place infrastructure and policy responses to deal with it on an ongoing basis in preparedness. And providing employment to the unemployed on demand would be one such preparedness response. So um, we come to, well, we do come to the job guarantee, but I want to situate a little bit uh, the job guarantee in the conversation that is taking place today. Okay. So uh, Keynesianism back in vogue, uh, it seems a whole lot of, of um, uh, support. You know, there's a lot, a lot of support out there for bold big government action, uh, bold expenditures. Um, we may have been, you know, we may have shed our phobia of debts and deficits, which is a very welcome thing. Um, um, how much this will stick, we will see. Um, but running it hot is what we will hear a lot. And we are already hearing, let's run the economy hot. Let's run labor markets hot. And there is a certain sense in which hot labor, uh, you know, an, a hot economy does create a lot more employment opportunities. But we know what this structure, the structure of this economy does. It, um, you know, uh, it creates inequality, growth brings inequality, and that has been the case for the last 50 years. So running it hot really is a, is a question of, you know, uh, who's getting the contract, where's the uh, funding going, what kind of activities are we um, supporting, whose incomes. We also know that there are environmental effects. Um, so running it hot just by 
you know, hitting private economic activity uh, is not necessarily um, uh, <clears throat> what we want uh, in terms of its environmental impact, financial instability, involuntary unemployment stays with us. However hot you're going to run the economy, as I said, firms don't like to hire the unemployed. And those who have been out of the job market for the longest period of time um, will have the hardest time. But also firms are not in the business of hiring everyone who wants a job. That is the job of the federal, of the federal government. So again, we come back to the question, full, full employment jobs for whom? There is a very interesting and kind of important dialogue on automatic stabilizers. This is all very welcome. Um, like strengthening unemployment insurance, nutrition assistance, um, and the whole list. Uh, conspicuously absent here is the right to a job or jobs program, okay? So um, what I call these is, I call these either benevolent or not so benevolent unemployment regimes. However well-meaning um, public policy may be, if it lacks the guarantee that if a person walks into the unemployment office or you know, is looking for a job and cannot find it, no matter how benevolent policy is, if it doesn't have a, an employment guarantee, it will remain an unemployment regime, a costly unemployment regime. There's a whole other conversation of what Keynes meant by fiscal policy for full employment. I won't engage in that. I have a paper um, on it, but I think, you know, Keynesianism is um, in, um, in, quote, in quotation for that, for that reason that it's not quite what Keynes would have prescribed. Okay. All right, what is the job guarantee? Job guarantee plus, well, the job guarantee is a public option. It's a public option uh, for jobs. And as I stated, there are really two choices. We either guarantee unemployment or we pay for unemployment, the, the paradigm within which we live, or we redirect our resources and we pay for employment, we guarantee employment. So it is a policy that aims to um, legally enforce uh, the right to employment. It's, it's not an obligation to employment, so not to be confused with workfare, but it is um, uh, it, it guarantees uh, um, <clears throat> jobs to those who meet them. It's not just another jobs program, it's a structural reform, it's a narrow alternative. I'll talk briefly about that. It's a superior, superior economic stabilizer um, um, and it's an it's a automatic macroeconomic stabilizer and a labor standard. Now, <clears throat> Okay, um, it's a plus because it is one of the two legs of, if you will, Harry Hopkins's uh, economic security agenda. You know, an economic security agenda um, had uh, in the New Dealer's minds two goals. One was direct and guaranteed employment, and the other one was income support of various kinds for people who cannot work. And that income support took the form of Social Security, um, unemployment insurance, um, um, child support, housing, you know, uh, the whole, what became to be known as the welfare safety net. Okay, but the first leg was missing, right? The guaranteed employment. Okay, so what is it? Well, when we say a guarantee, it just means when you go into the employment office, you're going to walk out with a job. It doesn't mean that you're guaranteed a job for life. Uh, irrespective of, of what you do. I think this is this is a bit of a confusion out there. It's a public option for jobs. Um, it's a safety net uh, for all the reasons that we described. There, there are some people who are especially vulnerable in the labor market. They um, need decent, uh, stable employment opportunities. There are others who have been outside of the labor force for a very long time and they have trouble transitioning. We know caregivers experience this problem um, if you are an unemployed parent, your chances of getting a job are higher than if you are a parent who has been out of the labor force for many years, taking care of children. So a transitional em employment opportunity is necessary. The same for young people who are graduating in, in the middle of a recession. Okay, it is a permanent program, not one you put in place just in the depths of a recession, but it's there, even in the best of times, because as we know, unemployment exists. And if we put in place that infrastructure, that means that the amplitudes of mass layoffs are not so severe. Right? We, we know that countries that have attempted to secure very low level of unemployment rates, um, you could call them full employment regimes, you can think of the corporatist model, 
uh, the Nordic countries uh, or even Japan, they don't see unemployment yo-yo like that uh, as, as it does in countries in the Western world where we just tolerate mass unemployment. There's a lot more stable um, uh, labor market. Okay, so it is a permanent program. And in that sense, it's an automatic stabilizer because as the economy contracts and folks lose their employment opportunity, they have another choice. They're able to uh, pick up a different employment opportunity. And so it really supplements the behavior of the private sector. So um, whatever changes occur in the private sector, they're gonna be offset by um, public sector employment. There is a little bit of a confusion of whether this, um, this is actually going to work as well as it, we say it will. And as I say, it's very important to recognize that full employment regimes are more stable regimes. Full employment economies are more stable economies. Private sector employment is more stable when there is a more stable purchasing uh, power, demand, and security <clears throat> all around. So we should not anticipate enormous amplitudes or enormous shifts and changes in the public program. But as we will get to in a moment, there is plenty of work around to do. And so I don't think that we're going to run out of, of jobs or projects that can be accomplished under this program. It's a bottom-up fiscal policy. Um, and this, I think, is another um, important macroeconomic feature because it really provides the employment opportunities where they need it. Um, in the current um, behavior of the labor market, employment opportunities always improve for the uh, high skilled, high wage uh, employed people who almost never really experience prolonged unemployment. It is those positive virtuous um, <clears throat> cycles that, that happen at the top. So, you know, you, you throw in contracts at firms, you're gonna improve the employment conditions of people who are already doing fairly well. What you want to do is target your employment strategies to those who have greatest ob obstacles. Okay, it's a structural reform, as I said, because it's a stabilization tool. It's a federally funded program because the, the public sector is the one responsible, right? It's, um, um, it's a, uh, the public sector is the only one that can function anti-cyclically and it is responsible for macroeconomic stabilization. It is responsible for the um, costs of uh, unemployment, the social costs of unemployment. And only, only the public sector can choke off the demand for jobs. The private sector, as I said, is not able to provide employment for all. Okay, it's universal access uh, and it's voluntary employment on demand open to all um, uh, folks. Who need it. It's a labor standard in the following sense that if that public option provides $15 an hour plus basic benefits, that becomes the standard for the economy. That <clears throat> um, is uh, the needed competition for the private sector to match the terms of the public job offer. Okay, very quickly, let me skip through here. What it's not, I want to emphasize, it's not compulsory work fair, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A, but nobody is forced or nobody is losing their existing benefits unless and until they show up for work. So it's, um, um, it's not that. Okay, it's not a handout, it's not temporary, it's not 100% employment. <clears throat> As I said, it's one of the two legs of economic security strategy and not just another infrastructure program. Forerunners, um, you know, there hasn't been really a universal job guarantee program around the world. There is a very large one that exists in India. It is the um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, very interesting case study. Um, it employs about 30% of households. And in the pandemic, it has been the only lifeline uh, for those uh, families. Uh, it's, it's enormous, it's very large. Um, and as you know, poverty is a serious uh, problem in India. It's very interestingly and democratically run and organized through local village forums. Um, there are many programs there are in the Western world, they're run in a different, in a different way. There is zero long-term unemployment areas in France um, that were just, uh, you know, the parliament just voted its expansion of this program, very successful. There has been expanded public works program in South Africa, the plan Hefes, Hefes that I have studied closely in Argentina, um, a couple of different ex programs in Austria, Future Jobs Fund in the UK, in the 70s, late 70s, we had One for Youth also very successful. There are many, 
There are many, large or small. They're forerunners because they are inspired by this idea that you know we got to secure the right to employment, um, and uh, we do it in voluntary, participatory ways. Um, so they offer some interesting insights on implementation. Um, we had modeled the job guarantee at the Levy Economics Institute with my colleagues um, before again the pandemic. At the time, we wanted a very ambitious, large program um, that would employ 15 million people, which I think would be quite adequate uh, today as well. Uh, we may need to employ more. But um, what we modeled is uh, 15 million people at um, $15 an hour plus benefits, um, including childcare. And what we found is that it permanently increased the real GDP by 500 to $600 billion. Um, permanently increased private sector employment. You know, the positive employment effect in the private sector, three to $4 million. Insignificant impact on inflation, negligible in fact, that was um, uh, in its peak. And um, permanently reduction, permanent reduction in welfare costs, uh, invisible, you know, uh, we didn't actually even model all of the uh, savings of uh, those expenditures, Im uh, significant improvement in state budgets. Um, and at a cost of one to 1.5% of, of GDP. Okay, um, very quickly, the Green New Deal has the job guarantee. It was called uh, perhaps the single most crucial aspect of the Green New Deal. Um, I think that reasonably we can identify three job guarantees in the Green New Deal resolution. The first one is that all hands on deck policy that we're talking about, you know, the, you know, bold, in infrastructure uh, investment that needs to take place with um, all manner of investment and in technology, et cetera. Now, it also has a um, job guarantee, employment guarantee with comparable income to those who have toiled in the fossil fuel industries uh, or early retirement. And there's a safety net also for the most vulnerable um, who are promised and guaranteed employment in the green transition, which I think is key in that discourse because um, that was always a stumbling block. You know, the <clears throat> fossil fuel companies often hold towns hostage to any transition policies um, because for fear of losing um, the little employment that they have. Um, but the, the third job guarantee here is the employment stabilizer. I think that this is really important. It's not you know, you know, the cleaning up the planet is not going to be a, a complete project. You know, maintenance uh, will need to be done even after we have accomplished our uh, most urgent needs. But so long as the market and the economy has a heartbeat, and so long as it goes through its cyclical, um, its cycles, we will still need an employment stabilizer, even in a clean world, in a green world. Um, and so. Uh, I think this is one useful way of thinking about um, the job guarantee as it's found in the Green New Deal discourse. But now we have Build Back Better, and now we have an articulation of an establishment of a civilian climate corp um, by the Biden administration. We don't have any details, so we don't know uh, what that would look like and what the scale of that would be, but it is for the um, remediation um, of uh, public lands um, about 30% uh, uh, until 2035, I believe, or 2030. Um, you can look up the details. But um, how could we do this? How can we use the civilian climate core and maybe use that as a vehicle for putting in place a job guarantee? The job guarantee, I often say, has always been green you know, from the early days of Roosevelt days, you know, from the tree army, those were very successful programs, early fire prevention methods, you know, the, all of the, the natural parks, the trails, um, all of the environmental work that was done then. But um, it is also important because it's not work for commercial return and it is always under provisioned. Um, and so a permanent climate, civilian climate uh, jobs corp, I think is, uh, is a good idea. So how could we potentially do it? Well, during the New Deal, there was a New Deal office in every county. So let's do the same thing again. Open a permanent CCC office in every county across the United States. 
um, supply CCC projects and job lists to the American job centers. These are our unemployment offices, right? They're, they're now called American job centers. <clears throat> there are multiple models of doing this. Um, some of them can be top down, they can be federal projects um, um, with specific guidelines. Some of them can and should be bottom up. Bottom up. Uh, there are many communities that have already uh, community groups that try to deal with social economic problems on the ground. Um, they already have some capacities, infrastructure. Uh, we should mobilize those um, and have them um, participate in the process of proposing the local projects. So it could be a hybrid model um, for developing these job lists and creating these jobs banks, if you will. Um, create a national online jobs portal, invite local community. <clears throat> Uh, groups um, pay at least $15 an hour. This would be, you know, this was hasten, hasten the, the fight for 15. Um, uh, health, uh, if, if we pay health, that would be another way of universalizing healthcare in the United States. Paid leave is another missing policy from our welfare um, package. Um, we propose childcare. I think it's a good idea that that also comes with the child uh, childcare. And I understand that this is might be a bit too ambitious uh, for, for some folks, but um, I think we should. Um, hire everyone who shows up. I think that's basically the criteria. Is there really a, is there really a, um, 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 a good reason if somebody comes and looks for work that we cannot find something of social environmental value for them to do? I think we need to be a lot more creative about thinking about you know, what a job is, uh, what uh, what we need and can do, how we can put our human capacities um, to work. All right, uh, I'm going to close out just with this. Um, the Green New Deal components were polled recently. Um, the job guarantee seems to enjoy the, the greatest support of all the components, but it's a popular uh, proposition. There were a number of polls back in 2018, such as Data for Progress, um, the most recent one was done by the Harris Hill um, survey, which showed um, overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, and this is what I wanted to conclude with, that um, jobs are not really, you know, of course, uh, there's, there was plenty of political wrangling um, at the policy level and plenty of conservative um, uh, governors even who refused to, to take some of the funding that FDR provided. I think we should have no illusion that, you know, this will not be a similar fight. But when the jobs were put in place, um, they were extremely popular. And um, I expect them to be so again. And so it's just a, a matter of making that a reality, uh, with which I'm going to end. And I'm going to say thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful stuff. Um, great, we're here. We've got the questions coming in through the Q&A. So if you're on the Zoom chat uh, around Brown and you're in that way, you can put your question in the Q&A. We're going to work through those. And if you're watching on YouTube live, you can put a question in the comments and we've got someone who's going to pick it up from there and relay it into the chat. We've got about 20 minutes left, which is great. So I'm not going to abuse my privileges chair. I'm going to go straight to the questions that are coming in. And so I'm going to start off with David Weil, who is an economist, is a macroeconomist here at Brown, and he's got the following question. I'm confused about the relationship between the idea that jobs are a right on the one hand and the idea that the NERU is incorrect on the other. Is there a logical dependence between these? Many neoclassical economists like me would say that surely the NERU relationship is not what we previously understood, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. This is a positive issue about which people can have disagreements. But is the question of whether jobs are a right dependent on the answer to that positive question? That's a very, that's a, that cuts right to the heart of it. Essentially, yeah, it's a key question. Are we doing this because it's functionally good because we can exploit a kink in our understanding? Or are we doing it because it's a rights claim, which actually does seem to be some fundamentally different? How do you feel about that? Yes, no, I appreciate that. I think... <clears throat> I think that there are two conversations. One is the philosoph philosophical co conversation of what is the right? Is it a categorical right? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, why does it appear in 1793 first? You know, why didn't we talk about the right to employment beforehand? And it has something to do, I think, with the evolution of a market economy, with capitalism, with, you know, uh, wage labor, the increasing reliance on, on commodification of, of labor, et cetera. I think that that, that you know, the, the fact that that is our ticket for subsistence is wage work, the predominant, I think it is connected. So it is maybe not, you know, a, a categorical right in the Kantian sense that, you know, some things are just right and some things are just wrong, but maybe in the context of what is a good life in, in, in a market economy, um, it is a right because it, it is one of the key and perhaps some of the most critical ways in which we self-determine is through paid employment. So maybe in that context, it is sort of a philosophical claim. I think what I'm saying about the Nairo is that it has been extremely effective in diverting the conversation away from some of these moral claims. And we as economists, I think we should engage with some of these moral claims um, and not uh, simply argue on supposed technocratic reasons that, you know, it's all well and good, it's lovely to do that, but we just can't do it because there is a trade-off. And so I think that it, um, you know, the Nairu relationship, um, whatever the empirical challenges are, I think that it is um, sensible to say that with the current methods of stabilization, we can observe inflationary pressures before we see uh, zero unemployment, let's say, right? So, so that they, they, you know, there are some periods where there's a little bit more of a trade-off, but um, I am unconvinced that it's been demand uh, you know, strong demand that is has generated the inflationary p- episodes that we have seen. But but let me let me grant you this: that there might be a, a trade off if we are trying to stimulate the economy, and if the economy tends to divert funding to hot sectors, successful sectors, um, winner industries, um, those who are at operating at capacity, who might be having trouble securing some employment. You might you might see that 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 would happen. This, I think, is preempted actually in Keynes's, um, in Keynes's chapter 20 uh, uh, of the general theory, where he talks uh, about the employment function and says, you know, if you want to increase employment by generalized demand, some of it is going to go towards prices and profits, which, which, um, which is a separate kind of economic argument. And I'm saying that, well, how about we do it another way? How about we go from the bottom and do stabilization that way um, and then find the source of inflation independent of removing income from the economy, right? Um, And so what we're seeing in terms of inflation today is mostly bottlenecks in housing and Medicare and education. So it's not really demand pool inflation. Like, I mean, we're not even seeing inflation now (laughs) all that much, but whatever price increases people are observing are structural issues. And so those can be dealt with structural um, uh, measures. I don't think unemployment is the answer. You know, Keynes also had a proposal for deferred payments um, and you you can potentially if, if there is a demand pull inflation, you could do that, but it's not unemployment that's the answer. So what I'm saying is that the Nairo is just a very convenient excuse to maintain unemployment. <laughs> All right, <laughs> great. Thank you, we'll move on from there. So two yeah. questions, one from Tony Levitas and another from Andrew Schrank are both related. Uh, Tony says, my sense is that demand for full employment have been displaced by demands for UBI, and that to one degree or another, MMT is associated with this displacement. How does this debate play out in the reaction to your work? Or more bluntly, why, if there is an employment crisis, if there is chronic unemployment that leads to poverty, et cetera, et cetera, why should we prefer jobs in the provision of jobs over UBI? Well, because people, they want jobs. You know, people want jobs. I mean, I, I get it that the UBI community has, has gotten, you know, some fair amount of attention, but I don't think necessarily it has displaced, the, the demand for jobs has been displaced by UBI. I mean, when you poll, you, you poll, and there have been YouGov polls even before the ones I, I mentioned. UBI does not poll as well as, as jobs. Um, and, and then even if, you know, we say, okay, let's just do some sort of income support. And, you know, as I said, the second leg of economic security is some sort of income support. But um, 
in, even when we do that, we find that income support policies don't create the missing jobs. That will be a perennial problem. And so I think that you know it's a, it's an entirely separate um, separate question. Of uh, it's not really about preference. I I personally you know don't like you bi uh, policies, um, but uh, you know UBI policies don't solve the problem of unemployment. Uh, so two related questions then about the operation of the program. So uh, Nicholas Aboge asked the following question: How do you fire people? Will they be fired? How does that work when you have a guarantee? Because termination has to be some part of an employment contract. And Andrew says, do you worry that unemployed people who don't show up will be further vilified by the political right with attendant consequences for the rest of the already beleaguered social safety net? Yeah, I, I get these questions often and I'm trying to figure out whether the guarantee is really confusing people um, because it's a job like any other. Uh, you cannot get paid if you don't show up for work, right? It's, it's just a job. The guarantee is that when you show up at the unemployment office, there will be an employment opportunity. And that doesn't negate all the other kind of, you know, social ways in which we structure our workplace and we, uh, you know, create a pr productive environment. It actually is a little one better than the way we do it in the private sector because, you know, the private sector uh, works on commercial return. And so there are very concrete criteria, you know, profit criteria for firing and hiring. Here, we're actually producing, uh, you know, social, social returns. So, you know, did we plant, did we plant the trees? Did we clean up the, you know, landfill? Did, I mean, there are different kinds of objectives. So, you know, in that sense, um, uh, you're not being laid off because it wasn't profitable but if you are abusive and ne neglectful or whatever to the environment you know you're you don't retain the job the example i use is the following okay you you can go into a public library right like everybody has the right to walk into a public library and access the resources now if you walk in uh and you abuse staff you will be walked out right can you, are you going to be prevented from coming back in next time? No, you're not going to be prevented. You know, if you can use a book but the second time, right? And it's, that's, the, that's the same idea. So it's not a guarantee to, you know, to sleep on the job and be paid. Jessica Burbank has a question. She works with a firm that basically tries to influence political opinion on these types of issues. And she says, what do you think the major challenges when it are when it comes to convincing the average voter in the US that the jobs guarantee is possible in the US? What are the dominant views or perhaps delusions that are the main barriers to people thinking that this is actually just possible in a country like the US? I mean, I think that uh, part of the problem is our discourse about government, right? The role of the government in the public sector. And so, you know, we've lived for 40, 50 years of, uh, you know, assault on, on the public sector, which has resulted in uh, reduced capacities. You know, the institutions have lost their funding, their, you know, uh, their staff, et cetera. So I think that there are legitimate concerns there. However, I really don't think that they're insurmountable. We, we see poorer countries do massive, successful jobs programs. Um, we certainly can, and we have had the experience. Um, I think part of it is discourse. You know, should this be the responsibility of the government, the public sector? We are moving away from some of these old frames. I think that's a good thing. The second thing is, you know, maybe it's a little bit about uh, marketing. I insist on the guarantee because um, it it drives the point across that, however, whoever you are, whatever your personal circumstances. Um, and whatever the state of the economy is, if you would like to work, I can't find a good economic reason or moral reason why we cannot secure that employment opportunity. Now, if, uh, if a civilian or a climate conservation corps is the way to push it forward, absolutely. We, it, we, know we need green jobs. Those are the job guaranteed jobs, you know, care jobs as well. Um, what I would just, urge policymakers to think about is that these are not one-off crisis solutions, that we do need an ongoing um, uh, support for the unemployed and basically, uh, you know, enhance the safety net. And, you know, I understand that these are challenging, challenging tasks, but um, if we were to secure jobs, I think that they will create the constituency 
and the support, much like with social security. So that's the constituency amongst voters. Jason Rice asked something, which we're going to talk about more when we do the podcast shortly, is the following. What are the, the challenges and pushback you can expect from the private sector to a jobs guarantee? As he says, aside from their interest in disciplining labor, I'd phrase that slightly differently. I mean, one of the shocking statistics that we can all trot out is that the majority of American workers earn, around, earn up to or less than $20 an hour which in a country this rich is quite astonishing. So there has been a huge shift in what economists call the labor share over the past 30 years. So if you divide the, um, the price level by uh, average blue collar wages, basically you have the cost structures of the 2020s and you've got 1970s wages for large parts of the population. So what the jobs guarantee essentially does, and you didn't say much about this in your presentation, but I think I want you to say more about it because it's on Jason's point, is you're, you're doing a wage floor. And when you do a wage floor of 15 or perhaps higher, you're basically forcing the firms that pay less than that to either improve their productivity or go out of business. That's basically it, which means that you will be destroying jobs at the same time. Second thing is, if 15 is the minimum, then it's only up from there, which means that the wage share is going to increase and the capital share is going to go down. And historically speaking, capital doesn't like it when the capital share goes down. They tend to get really annoyed and politically mobilized, and hence we had the 1980s. So do you worry that in a sense by doing this, you might be kind of, to use that old Marxist phrase, seeding the seeds of your own destruction in a sense? All right. So let's maybe talk first about the floor, the wage floor. Um, <clears throat> the job guarantee, no doubt, is not going to be the panacea to the labor market problems. We have a hollowing out in our labor market. So we, we don't want $15 an hour jobs. We want better jobs, right? And so it's not going to be, you know, the, the solution necessarily that people are looking for. I mean, you know, part of the things that we're doing with public investment, procurement policy, union jobs, you know, just supporting industry, there's a whole slew of uh, policies that we can put in place in conjunction with the job guarantee. You don't want it to be the, like the, the lone soldier out there. Mm -hmm. Will it destroy jobs? Now, like the concentration in the private sector is very large. Look what happened to Amazon. Had no trouble after Bernie Sanders shamed Bezos into like paying $15 an hour, do it, did it overnight, right? These companies, they can do it. Um, now, mom and pop shops, it's a legitimate concern for small communities now, but what would a community look like that is having, a, you know, imagine now 10% unemployment, but now all of a sudden you're looking at 2% unemployment. What's going to happen to the local um, taco truck, you know, to the local restaurant shop? They, they will be, I think, you know, some, some issues with folks who cannot pay, but there is also the safety net. There is also the employment safety net and the economic activity um, would help the mom and pop shops, I think. Now the employers who are relying on wage theft on abusive practices that just don't want to do it, yes, they should go out of business. And, and I think that you know we, we should take a stand on this. Uh, it's easier to do this if we were to do a national minimum wage policy, but then actually allow the J JG to do, do the heavy lifting. Um, so you know, like they'll all firms then have to match that floor. But the political question on sowing the seeds of your own destruction, I mean, <clears throat> um, Look, I mean, the scales have been tipped if you want to talk about it in those terms, capital and labor. And so we either throw our hands and we say, okay, <laughs> or uh, we say we, we, we need something to rebalance the scales. You know, one of the, you know, one of the, uh, I mean, you know, the left doesn't like sometimes the job guarantee because it's not a really good solution to, to the problems of capital, right? On the other hand, um, it is a, very democratic solution to a system that we have, right? We do recognize that, you know, we have a safety net and it was won, it was hard fought, right? And so that is just one other piece. Um, so I don't think that this is necessarily an easy battle, but that was the battle we had for, you know, the minimum wage, for child labor, for, you know, guaranteed public services. It's always, it's always going to be there. So we've got a couple of minutes left, two excellent questions, one off of YouTube and then one again inside here. You mentioned Amazon, so I'm going to go with Niccolo Fracolo, uh, Fracolo's question first, which is, 
In the US, market concentration has increased substantially in the last few decades. As a consequence, a small set of private firms is very influential in setting wages, prices and employment. This poses a political economy problem as the role of government in creating jobs and reaching full employment is therefore more limited than in the past. Does that impact the ability of the job guarantee to work? And then the last one, I'm just going to throw this in here because it's a very good one. How does David Graeber's theory of, pardon me, bullshit jobs fit into this? Because his critique was, you know, you don't need most of this work done. Let's people not do work for the sake of doing work. So how, how would you take those two things? The issue of concentration, essentially the private sector can crowd out government jobs rather than the other way around. And then basically the, the quote unquote bullshit jobs problem. Okay. Um, I don't want to minimize the political economy challenges, but the the criteria that the job guarantee has to clear is whether it is better than what we have today. Okay, and so um, they are not a reason for against the job guarantee or for its ineffectiveness because it just needs to be marginally more effective than having mass unemployment. Okay, um, so on the on the issue of bullshit jobs, um, you know, Graeber, you know, documents, you know, a lot of examples. And I want to say that pretty much all of his examples are, you know, private sector bullshit jobs, you know, watching over people over their shoulder, are they doing the right thing, you know, advertising, you know, uh, pushing paper, etc. Now, the job guarantee is not creating jobs for the sake of, um, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, it, it certainly is better than unemployment. So yes, you do want to create, you know, they're important in and of themselves because, you know, going back to the UBI questions, the cost of unemployment, the majority are non-monetary. And when you survey people why they want jobs, income is not at the top of the list, mm -hmm. okay? And so, um, so it's, it's for the sake of, we wanna be very careful what we're saying. You know, we're not painting rocks. I know that David Graeber, we had a little exchange with him and he's like, oh, we're not gonna be, you know, we don't want people to be painting rocks. I mean, I don't want people to be painting rocks, obviously. What's the public use of that? But can we, can we really think of uh, exhausted environmental work? I mean, we have real challenges. You know, you drive through the Midwest, it's flooded on ongoing basis. You know, we've got fires that, Anyway, I mean, there are just so many of these. And I think that we just need to be a little more uh, creative in what a job is and start uh, improving our lives through those public services. Now, the job guarantee is absolutely and perfectly consistent with the reduced hour, working hour. And it's something I discuss in my book that during the Francis Perkins days, the 30 hour working week is, was the popular um, a narrowly defeated proposal. So it's long overdue. And if the JG is a labor standard for full employment for of 30 hours, then that is a structural way in which we move forward with those policies um, throughout the economy. That's great and perfect timing for finishing on the hour. Thank you very much for a great presentation and perhaps an even better discussion. We're uh, going to record a podcast shortly and that will be up on our website and available at Apple and all the usual places afterwards if you want to follow this in a little bit more depth as to what we get into next. I want to thank everyone for uh, being on the Zoom with us today on the presentation, but most of all uh, to thank Pavlina for uh, giving us the talk about her book and sharing these ideas with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.